This episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is driven by Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos, includes everything you need to take your seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com, sign up for their free preview module, and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 158. week on the show dan and i are back together and we're wrapping up our canada trip all right welcome to episode 158 of the hp outdoors waterfowl podcast where you're on demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting I'm your host, Josh Palm. You can check us out at hpoutdoors.com. You can find us uh, across all the podcast content uh, databases out there. You can find us across social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you're a Facebook user, you can head over to our Facebook group, chat with a bunch of like-minded waterfowl hunters, and chat with my co-host, Dan Haruska. Dan, what's up? Dude, getting that cold front that everyone is uh, getting hammered with out west, yeah. But I got trees falling in my yard, got all kinds of junk on my back deck sliding around. But um, I'm not I'm not sure how I feel about this tonight. It's our first time that I'm actually FaceTiming and my my Internet's holding up and I see your face and just <laughs> <laughs> makes me want to laugh. Yeah, I see your face. I saw you laughing. So we'll time. see if I can, we'll <laughs> see if I can hold it together. I might be too immature for this. I don't know. I was gonna say there gonna be there'll be an extraordinary amount of giggling, I'm sure, this episode. But yeah, uh, this week we are brought to you by Quack Rack. Quack Rack is a premium decoy and gear hauling solution for your UTV or boat. It's 100% American made. Front racks, roof, roof baskets, and rear racks. Follow Quack Rack on Facebook and Instagram, and check out their hashtag Haul More Shoot More. Visit QuackRack.com today. Also, just real quick. I want to do thank a minute. I want to take a minute to thank uh, the other supporters of this week's episode. Gunner Kennels are engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind. The G1 Kennel has set a new industry standard and put Gunner in a category all its own. They're started to protect your pet, and it cont- continues to be at the center of everything they do. And they're dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at GunnerKennels.com. Thank you to Duck Camp. Duck Camp makes high-quality hunting apparel and their own camouflage patterns and premium fabrics. They're shaking up the industry with a more modern take on hunting apparel. They make really nice lightweight, midweight, and heavyweight hunting shirts that are perfect for the blind, back at camp, or a night out in town. We've uh, checked out their three-layer ultralight rain jacket. Love that thing. It's breathable, and it also packs down uh, right into its own pocket. It's a great outer shelf for cold weather hunts for layering underneath as well. Uh, Really versatile piece. Check out their new rain jacket and all the other gear that they offer at Duck Camp Hunting Apparel, duckcamp.com. Also, thank you to Base Map. It's the most comprehensive mapping app helping hunters plan, navigate, and share their next outdoor adventure. Base Map includes over 700 mapping layers to help hunters plan at home or navigate in the field. From property ownership, information to hunting on unit boundaries, Base Map's your go to mapping app for anyone looking to be more successful on their next hunt. No cell service, no problem. Download unlimited high-res offline maps to use while in the field. Base map's free to download and available on iOS and Android, covering all 50 states. Visit basemap.com to learn more and download today. Own the outdoors with Base Map. And finally, thank you to Yukonuba out in the field. How you prepare determines how you perform. With balanced fat and protein to support peak condition, Yukonuba premium performance dog food enhances strength, energy, and endurance. So when the pavement ends and the truck doors swing open. You and your dogs are ready for anything. Strong, focused, ready for anything. That's a Yukonuba dog. Also, thank you this week to TurtleBox Audio for their support of the show. If you're in the market for a Bluetooth speaker, definitely check them out. Okay, Dan. So we are officially wrapped up 
uh, from our Canada hunt. I think you've finally got all your bags and uh, personal effects from the trip back, yeah? I do. I just actually started unpacking my luggage today. So uh, getting everything washed up and ready for the local zones. Yeah. I mean, we were getting pretty intense Facebook updates from you there for a while. Um, I felt <laughs> I felt like I had an intimate I had a, an intimate look at the inner workings of your your disaster there. Um, it was quite a situation, which we'll probably get. It to was in, bad. We'll get we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, I don't, okay. I don't want to okay. dive right into that yet because you know I'm a big fan of Wildfowl Magazine, as I've said. <sighs> sure. And. Um, I like this, these little sections that they have in here that give Corda neat little stats and just sort of blurbs or whatever. And, you know, it seems like for the Atlantic flyway, at least we've been getting sort of like less opportunity to really do anything. Stop smiling at me. I mean, this is just, you just can't handle it. I wasn't laughing. <laughs> Still, you just, that you just, it's all you can do to hold it in. Anyway, uh, for the Atlantic flyway, it's been kind of like not great news right with bag limits and things like that well uh some good news on that front is delaware uh was they awarded 84 tags through a lottery in august for tundra swan seasons uh and they allowed for up to 13 non-resident hunters so uh, delaware joins eight other states that allow tundra swan hunting and I thought it was interesting of note that uh, although Maryland has the option of adding a swan hunt, the state wildlife agency has yet to address the possibility of adding a season. So um, I think it'd be kind of cool if they threw that in the mix, being that their goose limit has been dropped so significantly and their mallard limits down. I think it'd be cool to get a few guys some tundra swan uh, opportunities. But, you know, I guess we'll see what's going on. Uh, so I thought that was kind of cool. So what are the... What are the- did they name the eight states? Did not. Did not name the eight. But I thought you were coming at me there. No, I, I don't have that info right in front of me. I'd like to though. That's a good question to follow up on. Um, I did mm-hmm. see another little story in here though that caught my attention. Um, <laughs> so apparently in August there was a hailstorm in Montana that killed more than eleven thousand ducks and geese and other wetland birds at Big Lake. Uh, wildlife management area um you know they talk about how they've seen things like this before but um it's never like more than like a few hundred birds um it said that basically this was like 20 to 30 percent of the entire population at the lake was taken out by this hailstorm uh that's pretty significant i mean that's a (laughs) huge number of you said you said 11,000 11,000 yeah yeah so uh yeah, interesting. That that's really crazy. Um yeah, anyway. Uh so yeah, those are the two that I took away from this this most recent episode of Wildfowl that I thought was interesting. Um uh, let's see here. Oh, here's a good one I'll come at you with now that I'm looking at some numbers. Let's let's see how you how how well you do. <clears throat> what would you estimate the Number of pounds of aquatic vegetation mute swans consume per year on Chesapeake Bay. How many pounds of aquatic vegetation does a mute sw- do mute swans consume per year on Chesapeake Bay? Not a mute swan, but mute dude. Sounds like my roof is gonna blow off. Can you hear that through the mic? <laughs> Barely. All right, mute swans. Yearly. It's, it says mute swans plural consume <clears throat> per year on Chesapeake Bay. It's impossible. Um, is it in pounds or tonnage? Pounds. This is an audio show, so sitting there not making yeah. any noise is not ideal. I wanna, I, <laughs> Let's let's <laughs> let's, let's take go a gander. <laughs> let's, let's take a gander. Let's uh let's go quarter million. Quarter million. So you're like not even in the ballpark. Yeah, I figured. Way I have low, no idea. Way low. Way low. Twelve million. Four million. Twelve million. Twelve million, 12 million pounds. 
of aquatic vegetation. It's a lot of aquatic vegetation. <laughs> You're just blowing up numbers tonight. Yeah, I got one more here that caught my eye that I think is pretty neat. All so right. let's All right. let's see where you end up at on this one. Uh, number so of many, number so of many ducks millions. number of ducks killed in Canada during the 2017 season. Oh, I just found another I know little, it's an I audio another, show. I just found another this is little ridiculous. one I'm going to throw at you. This is fun. <laughs> um, Khakis? To, I'll, I'll go with a quarter million again. <laughs> just stuck on the quarter million. Uh, <laughs> 1,041,621 ducks. 1,047,000. 41,621. Quite a few. All right, I got one more here that's that's looking at me. Okay. Okay. So according to some doctor, Ducks Unlimited, the average hen size uh, the average size hen mallard can burn how many calories migrating from Saskatchewan to Louisiana? <laughs> Your face is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> how many how many calories does an average sized hen mallard burn migrating from Saskatchewan to Louisiana? Um good lord. Quarter million? <laughs> <laughs> quarter, quarter million? Um That's so. So you you're just talking flight time. I mean, just I, the migration. Not. I've read it verbatim as it is on the paper. I think that's open to interpretation because they can get pretty far in a couple of days, or they could be stopping and burning calories during their stops. Uh let's see. They are so small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Would you like a hint? Is it? It's not going to yeah. help. It's not going to help you, but it's just a little more nugget. Uh, the amount of calories that they burn migrating that far is equal to about eighteen percent of her body mass. It's equal to eighteen percent. About yeah. of her body mass. That's it. I mean, so you're talking. That's that's a pretty significant percentage of your t- a total body. I mean, if you burnt off 18% of your body mass right now, <laughs> I would be sexy. Yeah, you'd look sick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know, man. Take a gander. 40,000 calories. 30,000 calories. This is just not your best I have no idea. Tonight. It's not. One point I'm not a biologist. 1.8 million calories. No way. Oh, you're going to you're going to doc- you're going to argue with uh, a doctor of ducks? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 1.8 what, what is, say it again. 1. Point, okay. What? The average sized hen mallard can burn 1.8 million calories migrating from Saskatchewan to Louisiana, about 18% of her body mass. I don't believe it. Okay, well you can call up Skip Knowles and tell him that his publications is Publishing. Just check it out. Bar. Yeah. Anyway. So you tell me a hen can... mallard got it. A hen mallard has to eat like a hundred how many freaking Big Macs to make one point eight million calories? I mean I don't know what to tell you, dude. I don't believe it. Okay. Some of them can get down there in a couple days. Yeah, but, one point, but you have like that's not no, uh no way. That's not a significant feat. They're burning calories the whole time. They had no, literally they literally have to is. burn calories to stay in the air <laughs> for three days straight if they migrate that far. Yeah, it just seems like it's so many for such a little thing. It's eighteen percent of the body mass. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a big body mass. I don't know. I'm gonna look into that further. I don't like it. Fact check it, bro. It's not my. It's not my. I am. I am. Where are all the fact checkers at now? That always crush my dreams and hopes of life. 
Well, I mean, in go fa- find this one out. In fairness, I don't think any of your little nuggets were ever actually true. I think every one of them were fact checked correctly by someone. <laughs> That's what I mean. So someone will come up with a real answer to this. Uh, I don't see. Say, tell me again. Do you have the book out still? No, I threw it on the floor. One one point eight million. Was it one one point eight million calories? Correct. No way. One a one single duck. Are you talking about all the ducks ever combined? You're gonna make me consult the the, the publication again here. It it said an average. I don't get. I it don't says an get average sized. One duck. It doesn't say one duck. It says an average sized hen mallard can burn 1.8 million calories migrating from Saskatchewan to Louisiana. Um, and this is according to Dr. John Colusi. I don't know how that's spelled or if I'm pronouncing that right. Anyway, he works for Ducks Unlimited, so he clearly knows what's going on. Anywho, good times. All right. So we've uh, we've wrapped up our hunt in, in Canada and sort of just in the nick of time, I might say. Um, what was it? Maybe one, one group of hunters after us got the hunt before they got, they got hit with the cold and got froze out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. you know, Ben was still planning to run a couple more groups of clients, but they ended up having to like, you know, cancel and reschedule those because they got hit with this cold water or cold, cold front locked up all their water and, and all the birds moved out of the area. So that really kind of sucks. I mean, I can't imagine looking forward to a hunt all year just to get a call at the last minute and be like, yeah, hey, it we're froze out up here. That sucks. Yeah. Some of, well, there were guys in camp and they went, I think they went on the evening hunt and then, um, they were going to go out in the morning and there were like no birds around and the river was freezing, which they rarely see. So, um, yeah. And I just did some math and it would be almost 3,200 big Macs that that mallard would burn through 3,200 big Macs. Well, my, my gut tells me a lot of big Macs. Well, it is, but my gut tells me that because of the little, like just physical freaks that ducks are like, they can burn some calories. Their endurance is like absurd. I mean, they burn some fuel doing their thing. But some of them, some of the, it must, I'll go back to the average because I know some of them can fly what, like 500 miles in a night or even, even more than that. So, I mean, I don't know. 1.8 million seems like a lot to me. I'm stuck on that right now. But anyway, yeah. So they well, got, it's a lot more than a quarter out, million. And, I know um, that. <laughs> that was way off. <laughs> What I, I said, like eighty thousand. No, you're like, I think it was I like, that was th- you're like, you're like anyway, thirty seven. <laughs> yeah, so they, they, uh, and those guys, the guys from that were local around here that were hunting south of us, quite a few hours. Um, their farmer called the same time and said they were locked out too. So, uh, you know, we hit it at the right time, and you know, like you said, they packed up shop, headed out, and start hunting Kansas pretty soon yeah i was gonna say i mean that that means that obviously guys in the states here should start seeing some pretty good pushes if they haven't already um mm-hmm. which is, now guys in our group putting up in montana just getting thousands of birds and mm-hmm. they're showing up in you know everywhere else so yeah. yeah even the guys in missouri habitat flats yeah I, ira and tony been posting up that they're a little early Yep. And they, they also said that they've been early the last three years. I think Ira's one post. Hmm. Third year in a row that they showed up in mass numbers before season opened. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. From what I remember the last couple of years, our duck migration's sort of been in two pushes. We get mm-hmm. like a, a push around Thanksgiving of more puddle ducks, you know, gadwall and that kind of thing. And then they move out and it's pretty quiet until we get good pushes of divers in January. Pretty much what I've seen the last couple of years. Yeah. One little push and then we're out and then 
we have three days and then we're done for the year and then we get a good push of divers. <laughs> Seen that for a while now. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Is, is Ohio are Ohio season similar? I'm not sure. Like like do people hunt, check. like do people hunt the other side of Pine Matuming when there's like all those bird you know, all these birds come in the area and you can't I don't think so. I don't think. Hmm. I'll check check into that though. Interesting. That that wouldn't be cool. Be cool or for it'd you. Be super could, cool. Yeah. yeah I'd I'd forget about that. It's more hunting time. <laughs> Bang on them. Yeah, it'd be great. All right, man. Let's let's talk a little bit about this trip. And I think we should probably just start at the at the part that's probably the most uh that resonated the most with you, and that was navigating the airlines with firearms flying internationally. And we did we did some due diligence before we did before we left and we did do uh at least you did what you were told which was inaccurate uh i i had both forms that i needed but i didn't have the one filled out uh by the us customs before leaving the country which was also not the correct thing to do but it actually only ended up coming back to bite one of us <laughs> So why don't you tell the story about our flight home? Sure. And that's, you know, going back the the Air Canada did lose Al's, uh, his luggage on the way up, which included all of his diabetes medication and his hunting gear. But I did have a extra set of just about everything. So he was ready to go. And his gun was in your case. So, yeah. And I will just say about that. Um, his bag got pulled when you know they they ask you when you check your baggage if you have ammunition in your bag so uh he checked no i checked no i had the gun we so we flew with no ammunition so we get there this is flying from uh washington dulles to toronto in toronto i gotta get my gun to go through customs and they had pulled his bag off the flight and the guy in customs was like, yeah, I don't need to see it. If you tell me there's no ammo in there, that's fine. He checks our guns. We pay the fee. We get our paperwork. We roll. We're good to go. We go down to the scanner thing. I drop my gun on the scanner. They they get it to go, whatever. Throw it up the belt. Off it goes. He literally threw his his bag on the belt beside the beside where I did mine before my gun went up there. He threw it in there. And then we confirmed with the counter that they were like, uh, scheduled to go to the right place and stuff because we had actually missed our connection. Our flight from da- from Dallas to Toronto was delayed. So we missed our connection and had to get on a later flight, as we talked about. So for some reason, his bag was pulled off that flight for additional screening for some for some particular reason. So I don't know why that happened. Like I was the one that was checking a firearm. They didn't pull my bag. He checked no firearms, and they pulled his bag. It was it was very strange, uh, and it sucked because it had all his medication in there, which was not ideal. So, yeah, not fun. But he got it back in a decent amount of time. But anyway, <clears throat> so our issue came with the certificate of registration for personal effects taken abroad. It is the CBP form four four five seven, and definitely fill that out. The guy told us that we need to. It's essentially a uh, passport for your firearm, I guess. You can go to an international airport, get it stamped before you go. Um, We called, I know Donnie called before we left and um, talked to the U.S. Customs agent, and they said that we needed the declaration form, and that would be fine because that would show that we had it, and obviously that wasn't the case, so... um, but really, I mean, the way that the U.S. Customs guy was acting was pretty uncalled for. But, you know, threatening to confiscate our guns and slap tariffs on them. And then pretty much just for us asking what form it was that we actually needed. And he just kind of went off the handle. But, um, yeah, so he, after we sat there, I would say, and this is after talking with other people in the airport, other hunters, and um, actually talked to Ramsey Russell about this because he had a similar experience in Toronto. 
Um, you want to give yourself about three to four hours if you have a layover through Toronto. And that's just, it's a giant airport. Is that one of the biggest airports you've ever been in, Josh? Because that thing is huge. Um, I mean, it, it certainly felt big. I've been in some big airports. I don't know how just they compare. long. But yeah, I mean, you got to cover a lot of ground. You, you got to jump through a lot of hoops. And I think the thing that's frustrating about it is it's not clear. Like, right. no, like when I, I, I sort of expected that when I checked in, in, in Dulles and they saw, okay, you're connecting here. You got a firearm. Like they should give you a rundown right there of like, okay, you're going to land. You're going to go through customs. You're going to go to baggage claim. You're going to get your gun. Your bags are going to continue on or their bags are not going to continue on, whichever it is. And then you're going to go through, you know, whatever security, security and all like they should tell you these things. Like I had no clue. The only reason I knew was because you were a flight ahead of me because you made the original connection. So yeah. it was like, you know, I mean the, the, the group that was flying with us, uh, not hunting with us, but was on our flight going to Canada to hunt. They had a three hour connection in Toronto and missed the flight. <laughs> yeah. Like, I believe it. It took forever. Yeah. So anyway, um, so the guy, this guy chats for about an hour as we sit there in the customs, the, um, uh, Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Customs Office, and my our our gun is right behind him. It's on the table right behind him, and he sits there. He's talking to the lady next to us. And when I got there, I told her I was like, you know, um, our our flight boards and whatever it was, a half an hour. So I think we had an hour, hour and a half, whatever it was. And uh, she's like, yeah, when when it comes out, they'll get to it when when it's your turn. So, all right, easy enough. And I think that guy heard me, and I don't know if he thought I was being rude or whatever, which I was not. So he sat there and talked with everyone, guns right behind him. Then he just, out of the blue, decides to get up and go and start rummaging through it, which is fine. So then he calls us over, confirms everything with the guns, and that's when pretty much all of it went down and blah, 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 blah. So he let us go. He showed us the form that we needed and said that we needed that, but he didn't make us fill anything out or sign anything. Let us go when we had five minutes left to our flight took off. And um, we walked out. It was a 10 minute walk to our, to our gate. So we asked the lady, we're like, is our flight gone? She's like, yeah, that's gone. So the next one to Cleveland where we were at, where our truck was at was fully booked and there's another one to Pittsburgh. So my dad said he would drive down. We booked that. And the Cleveland flight was right next to ours. They said that if we were in reserve for Cleveland, they wouldn't have enough time to get our bags onto the Pittsburgh flight if it was fully booked. So we said, just send us to Pittsburgh. We'll be good with that. <clears throat> and then 48 of 50 seats were taken on the Cleveland flight because I was standing right next to the lady that was checking everyone in. So we could have been on that flight, been home. No issue. So we're waiting for the Pittsburgh flight. Like you, we got 20 minutes to go after we've been sitting there for four hours. 20 minutes to go, they call me up and ask me where another one. It was just a simple form that said I was flying with a firearm and I wasn't flying with ammunition. She said, where's your other? Do you have your other form? And I said, I only got one white one and they took it off my board pass in Edmonton and she said well you were supposed to have two I said I had one and they took it off my boarding pass in Edmonton I don't know what to tell you do you have more I'll fill one out and she goes yeah we should have some they had none in our section of the airport and it ended up we delayed the flight like 50 minutes they ended up turning the, the plane off and we're <laughs> we're waiting so you know all the yinzers going down to Pittsburgh from Toronto super pumped about that and then I was like, well, is our, is our stuff going to get on there? Which they claimed it was. It definitely didn't. I told them I wasn't getting on a plane until my uh, carry-on was on because I was on my camera equipment. So they had to come open the plane up, bring the elevator back over to the plane, put my carry-on on a plane. We get in there and sit down, and the lady comes back after about 10 minutes of us sitting down, and these people are already very upset with us. And uh, um, she said, the the plane is not balanced. You guys have to move. So she moved us back to the emergency exit. And these people were just like glaring at us the entire time. So that was pretty much it. And then um, we get there. Our luggage was not there. 
in Pittsburgh, and that was Monday night at 10.30. We landed, 11 o'clock we landed, got home, I don't know, 2.30, 3 in the morning. And Thursday, I got my gun from Pittsburgh, and I got my luggage from Cleveland three days later. You know, the, the unfortunate part about this is while, yes, that paperwork would have made it easier had you had it signed in Cleveland before you left. Uh, that paperwork never came up for me. Like it was never an issue. So clearly like if it's a required form, like it's definitely not enforced, Mm -hmm. (laughs) at least not uniformly. And like my experience was we were sitting there in Montreal getting ready to leave. And like 30 minutes before the plane boards, I hear my name come over like the airport wide intercom asking me to report to some gate. So I go there and airport security wants the keys to my locks on my gun case. I don't have TSA locks on, on my gun case. And that's by, that's not an accident. That's by choice. And they said, uh, you know, we need your key to inspect your gun case. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Can I come with you to provide the key? And they said, no, you have to give it to me. So I couldn't go with them. So I gave him the key. So now I'm sitting at the, at this random gate with 30 minutes before my flight board, just expecting that we're going to miss our flight now. So, uh, Oddly enough, it she came back in maybe 20, 25 minutes and everything was good to go. And I just, we just booked it down to the gate and got on the flight. Guns, everything made it, no problem. But I was shocked that they didn't just cut the locks because my, my expectation always has been, I don't, I, I personally choose not to use TSA locks because that means the TSA people have access to them and if they decide to go off the handle and like shoot people with my firearm like i want to try to prevent that if i can so i put my own locks on there that way if they ever use my gun in a harmful manner hopefully it's not when they check my gun i handed them the key but they would have to cut the locks off to actually get to it so my assumption would always have been uh, if they want to check my gun they would not try to take the time or effort to track me down they would cut the locks off inspect the case and then zip tie it shut and send it on its way so I was actually surprised that they they called called and tried to track down the key, and maybe ultimately they would have just cut them off had I not responded. But um, anyway, we did that, and everything worked out fine, and we made it made it back with everything. So um, my experience was not terrible. Flying with a gun internationally, the what I will say is it takes a little bit longer than what I would have anticipated mm-hmm. uh, to get through customs and security and all that stuff. I just didn't realize it was that long. So I would have appro- I would have factored in longer layovers, uh, if that, if I had done that. And then I will say, um, this was my first experience flying on air Canada and I was not impressed. Almost every person that I'd worked with through the the airline asking for questions or asking for guidance, um, was, uh, either in, uninterested in helping or just didn't know what didn't know because, uh, I got no information, like I said. like I, I was given nothing to work with or, or set any kind of expectations, uh, which was a little bit frustrating never having done this before. But uh, all in all, it was fine. We made it through. I just wish they would have been a little more forthcoming with the help. Um, but maybe they just didn't know. I don't know. But I would think that an airline that services Canada from the United States gets a fair amount of hunters flying with guns, and that would be sort of a standard like line of questioning that they would offer to travelers to see if they knew what they were doing. But um, I I would say the same thing, except for there's one girl that she ended up running out onto the tarmac to get those that final document that I needed. And I mean, I think she was probably running for a good half an hour because she got locked outside and had to run around the front to come back in the main doors. So she went straight Forrest Gump. Dude, she did. So she just kept running. But uh, came back and had the stuff, and I was like, I'm not sure if it's appropriate, but I'd like to give you a hug right now. And I, I really appreciate it. Bold yeah, I went in, went in for the Bold. kill. But no, she was, uh, Trying I was to like, I really. National harassment charge against you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Along with my guns taken. That was unreal. But anyway, um, so how I really like, same with you. Like, I, I wasn't impressed, but I still feel like I would do that over driving. Oh, a million there. percent. Yep. I would not say, I mean, to get to that place, to get to Saskatchewan from where we're at. No, thank you. Nope. No freaking <laughs> way. 
That'd be a long time. Uh-uh. Honestly, if it were a concern, I would have. I, I could see the case for renting a firearm from the guide. You know, we could rent guns from Ben, and that problem goes away. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I could see that. I cannot see driving that far. Just no way. No chance. It is a hike. Um, you're losing a couple of days of the hunt. Yeah, for sure. But um, I was... Uh, may I? I had another master lock that I had on my luggage, and they made me take that off in Cleveland. Said I couldn't have that; uh, it had to be TSA approved. So you can ha- you can fly with non TSA locks on your firearms, but not on your general luggage. Well, that's incorrect because I flew both ways with my general luggage locked with this with a master lock. Well, there you go. They are just I've so... done it every time. Every time that I throw me too. Every time me... that I throw that big old Sitka bag full of Sitka gear on a freaking belt for somebody to eye up and get into if they want. I'm like, I'm locking this crap up. <laughs> like they're going to have to at least work for it if they want to steal the stuff. So I didn't have any issues with it. I've, I've done that every time as well, except this time they told me I couldn't do it. Yeah. I think that's the frustrating part. Just the lack of consistency is, is very hard. Is it? Especially when you're trying to do the right thing and you're trying to abide by the rules. Like you can't, yeah. you can't hit a moving target. Right. I mean like just yeah. tell me what is right and I'll do that. Yep. Very frustrating. So what else you want to cover? You want actually want to talk about the overall hunt? Yeah. Kind of. I, I mean, we 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 we've touched on it. You know, when we um, were there with with Ben and and all them and Brian and everybody. And um, I I don't know. I mean, what's your what's your takeaway after having hunted Canada for the first time? I want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's i think that's my main takeaway it was it was awesome um everything i mean besides the hunting you know everything the lodge and the people around camp that was a great time um just i guess i didn't expect the the rolling hills that were out there you know there's definitely some really cool scenery that i i just didn't expect to see but um the amount of birds the amount of ducks, man. Good night. I w- I I would love to go back there every year just for duck hunting. And I like I like shooting geese, but just the amount of ducks after you limit out and you still have just thousands of ducks flying over top of you. Yeah. It was definitely it it definitely ruined the Atlantic Flyway. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, I think the the thing is it almost to me, hunting up there, it, like being an Atlantic Flyway hunter, and then you get up in a place like that, and I felt kind of like this in Canada or in Kansas last year. When you get that many birds around you, then working you, and it's something you're not used to, it it just almost doesn't feel real. Like it, it just right. it almost feels like a surreal thing when you're just shooting at groups of like a hundred plus ducks, push after push after push. I mean, they just keep coming, and it's like, I mean, you know, I, 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 we shot 215 birds in three days amongst our group while we were there. I mean, I won't, I won't shoot that many birds the rest of the season here. You yep. know what I mean? Like not even close, maybe several seasons. So it, 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 I can't say that it ruined up, ruined it for me because it just almost doesn't feel real. Right. Like it's just a completely <laughs> different experience. You go into the, that area. I, and I, I mean, honestly, I, I say that because I know a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people think about bucket list hunts and, you know, things that you want to try to do on like a special occasion, like with your dad or your son or like, you know, those once in a lifetime opportunities. And and I'm here to tell you now, like, if you want that once in a lifetime thing, like if you're going to save your money and, and make, you know, an investment in an, an experience, having hunted in the, in the areas that I've hunted, there is no, there is no, there's no second option. It's, it's Canada. Like I know hunting flooded mallards and timber is amazing. I know hunting snows in certain places, you know, I know all that stuff is amazing to me. It's, it's Canada. It, that, that feels to me like the pinnacle. Like it just feels like it doesn't get better than that because of the sheer volume of birds, their willingness to work, the amount of feed, uh, just, 
yeah, all of those things combined. I mean, we were wearing like t-shirts essentially in the afternoon. It was so mild and birds were just, you know, working it like, you know, like you just got a cold front down here in the States, you know I mean? It was just, it was, um, it was something else and it just kind of, yeah, I, 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 that's the thing that I would leave people to take away. Like if you can do it, that's the place to go. Bottom line. Yeah, I agree with you there. And it also makes you feel good as a caller. Like they do it. They're not pressured and they respond the way you expect birds to respond when you call. So yep. uh, I thought that was, you know, the super cool part. And it makes you feel like you're a really, really good hunter because they, they actually, you know, hit those, hit those corners and come flying back in, set it up and, you know, you have at it. So i tell you what, how did you, I thought you, you did well down at your end shooting for, yeah, for getting that one of the first times of the year. Dude, that was the first time <laughs> I fired at birds all season. Cause you know, just been so busy. I hadn't gotten out yet. So that was my first, uh, First try. And I, I mean, that to me was why it was worthwhile to go through the effort to fly with my gun. Cause I hadn't been shooting a bunch. It's my first hunt of the year. I just, I couldn't afford to have, be uncomfortable with a foreign gun. Right. I needed to just hit the ground running. And, uh, that's what having your own gun there does for you. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I felt like I held my own, you know, did all right. Yeah. It was a, it was a great time. And one thing I guess I didn't realize was, when you're in Canada and you have a guide, um, there has to be one guide in the blind that does not have a firearm. Correct. It's an actual guide. So I didn't realize that. I was like, and then one day I was like, Ben, are you gonna are you gonna shoot today? He's like, I can't. I was like, What do you mean you can't? He goes, Well, legally I can't do that. Yeah. And so that was a, you know, just another rule that they got. And you know, with all the guide licenses and everything else you have to go through, it's kind of neat the way it's set up. A little. You know, I'm sure it wouldn't be confusing after you looked into it a little more, but definitely a, a different mindset up there. Yeah. And I mean, it's, you know, it's a different mindset, but it's, it's a different mindset going in there knowing, okay, I can shoot eight ducks and I can shoot eight dark geese or, you know, eight geese and however many of them can be specs. I can shoot 20 snows and we got seven dudes in the blind and I'm seeing like <laughs> thousands of birds in the air. I'm like, all right, let's give it a go. <laughs> you know? Let's see. Well, that's, you know, before we left on, uh, I put a picture up on Facebook and had three boxes of boss shells in there. And, and then one guy said, is that just for your first morning hunt? Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, I tell you what, you go through some ammo. Like if you, if you want to take it to the plug, like you will, you will, you will burn some gunpowder. I mean, there's no I, doubt. I, about I don't it. know why you would not take it to the plug. I mean, no. I just that's just standard operating procedure for me. There's so many, so many opportunities, but no, man, that was, I mean, it's that was a, a bucket list hunt, you know, Saskatchewan and and getting up there and and laying it to them. So our first day, what we we had 38. And our second day, 85 and 92 on our third day. So mm-hmm. it was, uh, it was unreal. Yep. Big piles, uh, lots of action, watching dogs retrieve, you know, um, hunting from zero degrees in the morning to t-shirt weather in the afternoon, you know, just, you know, there's rolling hills like you talked about. And then there's parts where it's flat and it's, you know, like you think in your mind, it's going to look like where you can just see as far as you can see your fields and, um, all that stuff, man. I mean, it, it lived up to the expectation. That's, that's the only way I can say, I mean, I had lofty expectations and it delivered. Do you want to know one of the coolest parts of that trip? I, I think that'd be valuable information to know. There were, I'd, I'd say probably, what did we do? We did six hunts. I would say four of those hunts were probably the four best blinds that I've ever been in in my life as far as concealment. Yeah. We had some of the best brush blinds I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Probably my top 4 were on that trip. Yeah, and I, I, and we do some we do some good brushing, but man, there was there were some that were just spectacular. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, we were hunting a frame blinds the whole time. And I mean, birds just finishing in the decoys, no problems. So, 
None at all. Worked out really good. It was, it was a good time. I like that. So what do you think, man? I think... Besides our airport debacle on my end. I think I'm kind of ready to shoot some divers, man. I'm ready to shoot th- bluebills and canvasbacks. I think we need to pick a date for me to come down there. Yeah, I mean, it'd be pretty neat if you did that. I, I would love to get back over to Maryland and shoot sea ducks again. I don't. I know the season's different now. I don't know if that's even possible, but uh, that was a ton of fun. Um, I'm, it, you know, <laughs> funny story, side note, complete side note that I just remembered. Um, Vandekamp carried on a mallard onto the flight home <laughs> with no <laughs> issues. I mean, like yeah. one little piece of paperwork and he just walked on there with the dead bird and brought it and home. And they didn't check any of his gun information nope. either. Yep. And just brought it home and is going to be mounted. So, um, again, the experience is, you know, your mileage may vary kind of thing, but, uh, you know, make th- seeing birds go like, you know, it just renewed my interest in, I would love to have one of every species mounted and yep. I've got a freezer full of like four or five right now that I haven't mounted that I'd like to. Um, yeah, I think I might have to revisit that and just figure out how I'm going to do it and everything. But, uh, I, I really like the, the ducks that I have mounted now. I, I, I sort of, I guess I did it. I, I still have this feeling with deer as well with the ones that are mounted. Like when I look at those ducks, I immediately like go back in my mind to like the day that I shot that duck mm-hmm. and I can remember that hunt. Like I remember shooting that canvas back in November of like 2015 or whatever year it was, it, which was like unheard of in this area at that time. Like I, it was just, it was awesome. Just a cool, super cool hunt. Uh, me and my buddy Carlos were hunting. A, like a six pack of uh, cans came in at the time. You could only shoot one per guy, and we both dropped drakes out of that group. And I was just like, man, what a cool deal, man! Like just a cool, cool deal. And uh, every time I look at that duck sitting on my desk, I guess relive that hunt, which is so you know just awesome. So and it just looks like my beard up there hanging out <laughs> yeah <laughs> do you do you when you get stuff mounted do you try to replicate how it was like to even remember the hunt even more no. like the no usually no. like like with deer i try to you know if they come in looking for a fight i'll get the ears pinned back or yeah you know that uh eider i got is going to be on an icy rock yeah i try I think to, that'll be cool i try to my thought on it is i try to replicate how they're best shown in in nature nature so nature. like <laughs> you know um like i have i have in my mind for a pintail mount uh this is going to be like sort of the grand finale for me i think but um i'd like a mature pintail drake where it sits on like a cabinet with an acrylic enclosure on top of with um habitat in there Mm-hmm. And I have it, and I just, I feel like when I picture pintails, I picture them lifting up off the water and flying in a very vertical posture with their yes. tail fl- float, like flapping down below them and like sort of water dropping off their feet as they're flying up off the water. Yeah. Um, that's just what I think of when I think of a pintail duck. So that's how I want to have one mounted in my, in my house. And I think of bluebills just, you know, wings bowed up, legs out on the you know right on the deck coming in you need like four of them yeah i mean just all you know i just i just that's what i like to do and certainly there's certain ducks where you can do a lot of different poses and things like that that sort of resonate the same but um i think that's what's so cool about taxidermy is that like you can really customize it to what resonates with you and how you best connect with that bird and it to me, it truly is like the ultimate, um, you know, ultimate, uh, I don't know what the word that I'm looking for here. Homage. Um, yeah. Like homage to that, to that duck and what it, what it meant to you and stuff. So uh, pretty cool deal. And I, I think I want to try to get, get it back on my mounting kick and get a few more done. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's about that time, I think. I need to I need to get a big old sprig as well. Yeah. I'm not sure. I I, I mean the the pintails when they're preening just look sick. Mm-hmm. Just, mm. I've never I've never killed a mature drake pintail. Everyone that I've always kids always been like a youngin. Yep. yep. Young and dumb. Uh, and we killed a bunch of the well not a bunch, but we killed several of those in Canada. Yeah. That was the only other duck we really killed. I don't think we killed any widgeon up there. No. Um surprising. The, the one group the other group that was in camp shot a bufflehead <laughs> random. So shoot so, like, shoot so, like so. seventy ducks <laughs> mallards and shoot one bufflehead out of nowhere. <laughs> That's wild. So, so, so we're out there cleaning ducks. We made all those. I, we called it pintail poppers because most of the most of the poppers I made were out of pintails, and then uh, a bunch of mallards too. And then we threw that buffalo head in there. So somebody got <laughs> a a popper, and no one. I didn't hear anyone complain. So maybe they just thought it was. They all tasted like that. <laughs> yeah, maybe they didn't know any better. It maybe it tasted good. Maybe it was just it was delicious. Good, yeah. Maybe it was just great. Yeah. I, yeah, I was like, who shot this? Dude. Huh? Was it a Drake? Might... Was it a Drake at least, or was it a hen? No. It was a hen. A hen. Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So they came buzzing across, so they lit it up. But... Yeah. Legal. Send it. So that was cool. You know, Ethan from Ethan Rogers from North Carolina won a hunt from our 100th episode. And um, we'll actually get to hunt with him in January because his buddy won the hunt to Big Kansas. So he's he's coming <laughs> out there. We get to. Lucky. He I know. So, so he, uh, you know, so he he's going to be heading out there and get to hang out with them more. So you know, good people, and uh, I just can't say enough about it. It was a great time, and like you said expectations even though you you try and set yourself up to not be disappointed but you just know what saskatchewan is all about so when you go up there your expectations are high and and everything was met so it was and really i mean you can do it at a not bad price yeah i mean you can even do it diy up there yep i mean it can be done it takes effort and you know that's enough to deter some people from trying it. But if you're on a budget, you know, you can do it up there, man. And you know, all these people go up to North Dakota and I, I get that. It's not, if I'm going that far for my money, I'm pushing a little bit further North and I'm getting up into Canada. Uh, it was just really, yeah, I can't wait to get back. I'll have to ask my buddy, um, kind of what the, the cost breakdown was for them. Cause they did it. You know, the do-it-yourself hunt while we were up there, they went for a few more days, but they ended up killing, I think, over 500 birds for yeah. the time they were up there. Jeez. Ten guys and uh, just hammered it. So, yeah, we'll see what, see what that breakdown was. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can get into some epic numbers, especially if you get into snows, man. Whew. Mm-hmm. You can do some damage up there, which is just a lot of fun. So, yeah. I mean, literally my shoulder was sore. By day three, my shoulder was sore from just shooting guns because in the afternoons you know we were shooting in like t-shirts and i'm just like <laughs> ripping through boxes of shells <laughs> uh, so yeah yeah and a reminder if you do go up there and have contacts take take solution because nowhere sells it <laughs> or there's just no places that sell anything because you're in the middle of nowhere yeah but I mean, we didn't go to any many stores or anything <laughs> no no definitely yeah. not yeah Hmm. So anywho, at any rate, um, you got anything else? One last thing you want to throw at us this week before we before we punch out of here? Did you dress up for Halloween? Um, no, I just had one of the masks from the Purge. Walked hmm. around in that, took pictures. Nice. Did you? I did. You know me, bruh. You know we do this. I just can't wait for Jen to post it so I screenshot it. It's it's pretty mild. I'll still throw up your little safari curious, <laughs> curious George one. Um, but I was a, so funny story. I was a shark. My son and I were sharks 
And my wife and my daughter were scuba divers. So they had like little air tanks. And we basically got onto this idea because it was the one thing that my daughter could wear as a 10 month old. And we hooked like the air tube up to her, like pacifier and made little flippers for her. And that was kind of it. So in the time that we decided to do this and we got the stuff, the whole like baby shark thing with the nationals like had taken off. So people are wearing these shark costumes like to the ballpark and they're like all over the place with this stuff. So we got a lot of the baby shark stuff, which is fine. Cause you know, I'm pumped that the Nats won the series and everything. But um, yeah, that was not the intention, but it was sort of a dual served dual purpose. Mm-hmm. It's kind of neat. So yeah. yeah. Congrats to the Nats. Yeah, man. This has been awesome. I mean, dude, I'm telling you right now, this baseball playoffs has just been brutal on me because I've been up like I get up at 5 a.m. every day and I was up till past one o'clock, you know, multiple nights in a row just watching this team pulling for him and stuff. So I'm glad they won it. I'm glad it's over. I need to get some, get some sleep, though. So it's been it's been tough. But. Yeah, no, it was awesome to watch. Awesome hunt. And it's time to get back into it around here. I don't think we've talked about so, this also, though, but how do you feel about that Michigan-Penn State game, Brad? That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, day, my days are done there. My days are done. I'm sure late at night when no one's watching, you slip on the, <laughs> the, the Michigan starter jacket. Oh, hey, how about – so today I did um, – I ordered a pair of waiters, one pair – uh, it's like a one year or not one year size one boot and six, seven, uh, body size. So, or whatever it is, 12 boot, whatever it is. Once it, once it breaks over the tees. So Dawson got to try it on first, super pumped. And actually someone in our group messaged me and is sending a pair of, uh, like size five waiters, Cabela's breathable. So, I'll have two of my three kids outfitted. I'll have to pick up another pair here, but definitely uh, if it doesn't get too chilly, we'll be heading out and let them experience some duck hunting. Neat. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm pumped about that. It's all good stuff, man. They're fighting over who I'm taking first, but I think I'll probably just try and probably take out that Lucky Duck 2 by 4 and cut it down and just have them in a little area. Mm-hmm. Let them yeah. play some games and eat some snacks. Yeah, that's cool. That's good times, man. Awesome. Yes, sir. Awesome stuff. All right, man. Let's get out of here for this week. Uh, unless you got one last thing you want to throw at me. Nope. Wrap it up. All right, cool. Well, before we do that, I just want to take a minute to thank Quack Rack, Gunner Kennels, Duck Camp, Base Map, Yukonuba, Turtle Box Audio, and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos that includes everything you need to take your finished or to take your seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. You'd think that by as many times as I've said this, I'd have this like memorized by heart. Just, just find a way to screw it up every week. Anyway, visit cornerstone gun dog academy.com sign up for their free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone gun dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. That does it for episode 158. Hopefully you enjoyed our chat about wrapping up our Canada hunt and all the problems and the triumphs that we experienced over the course of that couple day hunt. If you're new to the show, head over to iTunes. You can find all of our past episodes there and you can also leave us a five star rating and review. It'll help hunters just like you find our show. That's going to do it for this week. Until next time, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.